This is part four of a who knows how many part series because it's important that we tear this onion apart one layer at a time. We have been inculcated from birth, it seems, into an absolute terrifying fear of our God and hell. And we want to talk more about that. We want to, we want to look at every single passage. We're going to take a look at every single word and put it in context. Last week, we looked at three words that are often translated hell in the King James Version, uh, Gehenna, Sheol, and Hades. We're going to look at Gehenna again a little bit, but we're also going to look at the fourth and the last word that is translated hell, and that is Tartarus. It is generally translated hell, and that's probably a good idea because it's the closest thing in Scripture to a place where there is fire and darkness. It only shows up in Greek and Hebrew. It's the only word that does that. It shows up only once in the Bible. And that's in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. Rick just read that for us. Read it carefully and two things become evident very quickly. If you just read it and get the shackles off of your eyes. It is for fallen angels. Not for humans. And it is not permanent. It's also not really a place of fire, but it's a place of darkness. And guess what Greek philosophers for hundreds of years before Christ said Hades was? A place of shadows, darkness, no purpose, wandering lost and confused. No redemption possible to them. Although some later Greek philosophers would come up with the idea that exceptional people might somehow be rescued from that eternity. Obviously, Peter is not referring to Greek philosophy here. He's referring to something different, but he's using terms that the people would understand. I remind you again that half of the things we say to each other would be incomprehensible to somebody even in 1980. But what about 1880? I ran a red light. What does that mean? I saw a beautiful sunrise, so I pulled out my phone. I took a picture, and I sent it to my friends, and then I posted it online for everybody to see, and then my phone told me I needed to turn left. None of these things would make sense. We have to know the words in their context of what the people the people who heard these thought something. What was it the writer intended for them to hear? And what did they hear? Peter should be reminding us here of Matthew 24, 41. When Jesus refers to a lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It's not prepared for the bulk of mankind. Also in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14. That we'll look at again later in another, ser- another sermon. Where the lake of fire is there to destroy death and Hades. No mention of the bulk of mankind. But because we must. We have been programmed by our past. By well-meaning teachers and preachers. And they were well-meaning. We will look at all those passages where these words appear. But for now we got a larger question to ask. And that is. When does forever end? I can remember talking to my then 11-year-old, I think she was 11-year-old then, granddaughter, and she was asking me about visiting prisons that I visit and about a particular man who had called me when I was visiting their house in South Carolina, called me from death row. Well, what is death row? It's kind of hard to explain that to 10 or 11-year-old girl. And then I said, but he's been in there a very long time, and I go down to see him about every six weeks or so. She goes, how long has he been in there? And at that time, I said, 26 years. And her face just, and she goes, that's too long. And I said, how long do you think he should be in there? What would you do? And she thought for just a moment. She said, I would send him to his room and make him think about what he did. (laughs) Well, of course, my heart does this, but... I don't think that's adequate punishment for somebody who's on death row, if they deserve to be on death row. And I'm not a death penalty guy, so I'm just saying that's our system. But I think that there's a lot of room in between that most of us would agree with. 
life sentences in many countries are no more than 10 to 15 years. We somehow have, have allowed that to blossom into something bigger. But when does eternity end? When is enough enough? I was told two illustrations of eternity by preachers who were gifted at, uh, at, at what Adam would say of using metaphor and story and tugging at your heartstrings, but not in a good way. I'm going to share them with you about what eternity is like. They said, imagine that the earth is a solid ball of stainless steel. I guess rust would be an issue in the in illustration, but once again, I was not the easiest child to raise. This is probably five or six years old when I heard this. The ball, the earth is a ball of stainless steel, and you put one ant at the equator, and the ant has to walk all around the earth, and then walk around the earth again. How long would it take that ant to wear a trench a mile deep in the earth? And of course, we're, we're just sitting there trying to do the math, but it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. That's got to be some ant, too. And then how long will it take till he actually bisects and cuts the, the earth in half? That's not even this long in hell. We're all going, okay, but he wasn't done. He said, imagine a hummingbird. Now, those of you who don't know, hummingbirds flap their wings about 4,000 times a minute on average. They have different speeds for different things that they do. But on average, 4,000 times a second. Imagine a hummingbird who only flaps its wings once every 1,000 years. If it was tasked with taking one grain of sand all the way to the moon, dropping it off, turning around and coming back. If you don't know that, that's on average, the moon does change its distance, but on average, 238,900 miles, which I'm sure you knew. I'm sorry. Uh, But this flapping one time a second to there and back. By the time it had taken the entire earth to the moon would not even be that long in hell. Well, that's a terrifying place, isn't it? We can absorb some of this because as our technology has grown and our knowledge has grown, we have also learned to use bigger numbers. And in, you know, the American debt has more than doubled in the last 10 years. You know, it's now up over $30 trillion and just rolling along. But using words like trillions, quadrillions, this or a light year would have meant nothing to somebody even a hundred years ago. Trillions, they'd understand. A light year? People might have talked about it, about the distance, that, but they had no reliable way of measuring the speed of light, although they were a lot smarter than we give them credit for. And so these numbers and eternity and infinity, that's scary. So we all wanted to know, how do you go to hell? Sadly, the answer was, it's pretty easy. There's so many pathways that the vast majority, we were told, of all humans made in the image of God were going to be in that pit while that hummingbird transferred the moon, the earth to the moon. But that was only that long in an eternity that would never end. You could get there for being born in the wrong place and therefore never hearing the name of Jesus. You could get there from being turned away from religion and church by false teachers who abused you or who mistreated your family. You could could go there because you just joined the wrong church. You could be there because you weren't baptized the right way. That you, perhaps by gambling, by, uh, by dancing, or by using instruments in worship. All of these things, I'm serious. Playing cards. The list was very, very long. The preachers would say that Jesus told, him, told us himself that this was true because he said, few there be that find it. More on that phrase in another sermon. Well, this made us wonder about the entire plan. And while Holly sang beautifully about the goodness of God, I feared God, but I had a hard time with goodness. If 99% or whatever is going to burn in this in what seems to be a completely out of ratio, out of balance, 
no logic to how long the punishment lasts for something we did wrong in these few 70, 80, 90 years. Many, much of which would have been outside our control. If you're born in a place that you're not going to hear the name of Jesus, where are you going to hear it? That's outside of your control. The good news did not sound good to our friends when we would try to talk to them about coming to church. The good news didn't sound very good to me. I had questions. Wasn't allowed to ask them in my particular tribe, but I had questions. We've read our Bibles many times, and we see words that indicate those who are lost are lost forever, and the flames of their torment are up forever. But have you ever asked a very basic question? How long is forever? Is it, like the, the minister says, about the splitting of the earth by the atom, by the ant, sorry, we can, we can do the atom too, uh, by the ant, or the hummingbird flying, is, 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 is that an accurate description of what the Bible was talking about? Is that what the writers intended? Is that what the readers or the listeners got from this? So, that's important that we know our measurements. We know what is being measured. I was in Canada a couple of years ago in, in, a, in a minibus where some of us were Canadian and I believe one was American and one had spent time in America. And they were asking about our lives here in Tennessee and you know, how far is it there and, and I would respond in miles and somebody else would respond in kilometers or kilometers. And at one time we were talking about weights and measures, uh, about something entirely different. And one of the, the men, who's one of, my, my, one of the favorite people on the planet, actually said, um, I'm really sorry, but I'm so Canadian, I don't know what any of those are really. And we've been talking about ounces and pounds and gallons, and now we all had to do math. You need to know what the measurement is. Pop quiz, what was the word for a million in Isaiah's time or in Jesus' time. What was the word for a million in Aramaic, Hebrew, or Greek? Well, it's a trick question. They didn't have a word for it. They didn't have a concept of that. Whenever they wanted to say that something was without being able to be measured, for example, in 2 Chronicles, 2, uh, 2 Chronicles 5, whenever they dedicate the temple and here come in all the animals, they say there were too many to count. Now, is that technically true? Scientific age, 2024? No, we can count. We can count. But for them, it was because they didn't have numbers that did that. They didn't use numbers in those ways. There are, if they decide to get really crazy, they would go thousands. For example, David uh, the psalmist says, the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to the Lord. I asked a group this last week, I said, so who do the rest of the cattle belong to? And they said, well, well, he's just meaning that they all do. And I've said, yes, they use numbers in a different way than we use. We demand scientific precision, don't we? Well, not always. If I say, we'll be down in a minute, that doesn't mean 60 seconds, but we all understand that's a bubble, right? We do. But if I say, I've got $1,000, people expect that to be precise. If you say, this cost 1000 and I say, I've got 1000 and I lay a different number down, one of us is going to be displeased, right? They weren't like this. So they might decide to go a thousand and thousands and tens of thousands. And a few times they would even say, and hundreds of thousands. And sometimes they would even times things by other numbers that they, they liked, like the 12 tribes or the 12 patriarchs, the 12 apostles. And they say 12 times 12 times 10,000 times 10,000. And people today read that in the West and go, okay, that means 144,000. No, it doesn't. That's what the math says. But that's not what they meant. They just meant a lot. Have you ever noticed that everything happens in Scripture in a round number? 3,000 were baptized. And I'm going, 
I'm glad the last one decided not to be baptized and throw that number completely off. And then later 5,000 are. So is the Bible then imprecise? And No, it used the language that the people understood then. If you were to write the Bible today, the people back then wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about. Because the phrases you would use, the numbers you would use, the, the assumptions you would make, they have no concept. We have to go back to their world. Even today, by the way, many languages on this earth don't have numbers that go beyond 10 or 30. I don't know why 30 is a stop, but there are several languages, quite a few in Africa and Asia, don't go beyond 30. If they want more, they will say, I have 30 cattle in abundance. They'll put that on there. It's rather like in Indonesian, the language in Indonesian um, you don't conjugate verbs. You don't have past and, and future. Instead, you would say, I am eating tomorrow. Or, I am eating yesterday. And that's their way of saying, I ate yesterday, and I will be eating tomorrow. You have to know the languages, and you have to know how they were used. There's no word for the number that most of us were able to figure out because we pull out, here we go, our phones and use the calculator app to determine it. Once again, nobody before 2000 understands that because you had little flip phones, uh, phones or Blackberries if you were super important um, executive types that wear suits on airplanes and you know who you are. That would you know hold those out? I remember, I remember the first Palm Pilot that came out, and we were in awe that you could actually put a note in a little machine. My wife and I like to watch a lot of British TV uh, on an app that streams to our TV. Do you see how this sound? Nobody even 15 years ago under, uh, would have understood that phrase. No one. And right now we're streaming something which took place in the 90s. The computers were massive. Remember the monitors? Do you remember? And they would, they would click to their, their line DOS system. And this was looked upon as super cool. We're going to the computer. You know, that, that's you know, this computational device. And they would be so excited. We need to understand language changes just that fast. We casually speak of star systems being a hundred... 1,000, 5,000 light years away. But try to explain that to anyone born before 1940 and you'll get a blank face at, at best. Burned at the stake at worst. I was thinking of that once as I was flying back from Los Angeles from speaking out at Pepperdine. And I looked down and was seeing and I thought, all of a sudden, everything in my experience is unexplainable. I'm sitting comfortably, let's just pretend, in an airplane seat. I'm sitting comfortably eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at 31,000 feet, going approximately 416 miles per hour. I didn't figure out the knots and miles. And I'm listening to a book being read by a guy that died years ago. All of those will get you burned at the stake. We need to get back to the ancients. Eternal and forever meant something very different than it does to us. D. Campbell Morgan, one of um, the great leading evangelical scholars who wrote the, the classic book, God's Method with Man, said this, quote, There is no word in the whole book of God corresponding with our word, eternal, which is commonly used among us meaning absolutely without end, end of quote. By the way, if you're thinking this is some sort of modern liberal teaching, uh, he wrote that over 100 years ago. It's well long been known that the ancients did not have a word which meant infinity or eternity. They would use eternal to mean something else. We're going to give examples. Jude verse 7 says that Sodom's punishment is eternal. Ezekiel 16, verses 53 through 56, says that Sodom's fortunes will be restored by God 
after the time of punishment is over. So which is it? Is that a contradiction? Not to them. Eternal to them was a length of time. But eternity was not a concept that they worked with. It meant until the time of punishment was over. I'm, I'm sat here right at Ezekiel, so I can even say that. I remember Jude 7. Everybody can remember that. Don't even have to remember a chapter. Then he says here in Ezekiel, However, I will restore the, the fortunes of Sodom and her daughters, and of Samaria and her daughters, and your fortunes along with them. So the righteous people and Sodom will all be restored alongside each other, so that you may bear your disgrace and be ashamed of all you've done and giving them comfort. And your sisters, Sodom with her daughters, in other words, like her, Samaria with her daughters will return to what they were before. You and your daughters will return to what you were before. You would not even mention your system, Sodom, in the day of your pride. And it goes on. You're going, they're going to be restored. Zephaniah, by the way, chapter 2, verse 9, names several nations or cities, including Sodom and the Ammonites, and says, they will be a place of weeds and salt pits, a wasteland forever. And Jeremiah agrees early in his book. And then in chapter 49, verse 6, he says, quote, Yet afterward, I will restore the fortunes of the Ammonites, declares the Lord. Forever didn't mean what it means to us. And we've got to get that through our skulls so that we can sing of the goodness of God and not have a, what the Catholics refer to as a mental reserve of, yes, but which I had most of my life. By the way, the notes, we say this often, but needs to be said. The notes for every sermon with all these scriptures in it are in the description box of the video on YouTube. They are free. They are without copyright. You may use any of, of our videos except for the songs, which we have to pay copyright for. Uh, you can use any of them, my teaching and the notes freely. You do not have to attribute them to me. You don't have to say, you know, Patrick Mead, no, no, I stole everything I know about God from this book where a bunch of guys wrote about him. So go ahead and use them. Um, we're not going to try to upsell or anything like that. But the notes are there. In Deuteronomy 23 and verse 3, one of the passages I use very frequently, the Moabites and the Ammonites are not allowed to, listen carefully, not allowed to, listen, to enter the temple forever until the 10th generation. Now, why is there a word eternal and then the word until? For us, that does not make sense because we speak Western languages, modern languages. And by the way, don't mean to insult anybody who is speaking an African language or an Asian language. If they are a modern society, they're doing the same thing we're doing. They're using eternity and eternal to mean same thing when it doesn't. Habakkuk uh, chapter 3. It looks like Habakkuk, but it's Habakkuk. Uh, chapter 3 and verse 6 says, The mountain, mountains are everlasting until they are shattered. Everlasting until. Remember all those passages people say, but it says everlasting until. The NIV, by the way, changes the word eternal there, which the King James Version says, they are eternal until they're shattered. The NIV changes the word eternal to age old, and that's probably more correct. They are age old until they are shattered. The priesthood of Aaron, do you remember Exodus 40 and verse 15? It will last forever, but it's been gone for thousands of years. Since the fall of Jerusalem and the loss of the records of the Jews, there's not a Jew today that can tell you with any any bit of certainty, what tribe they come from. Therefore, there's no tribe of Aaron and his priesthood. There's no tribe of Levi with Aaron and his priesthood. That's gone. Hebrews 7 makes it plain that that priesthood has been replaced by the priesthood of Christ. So it is a forever until. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 13, God says he will dwell in Solomon's temple forever. And that temple was destroyed within a few generations 
of Solomon and has never been rebuilt. The place where it is now is a mosque and has been for many, many centuries. Where does God dwell now? The Bible says he dwells in us, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So is the Bible just so confusing? It's only confusing because we took the words and made assumptions rather than looking to see what did the writer intend his readers to hear and what did they hear? When you enter the world of their language, it changes. The words forever and eternal to, meant to the ancients, ancients as long as God intends or until the purpose is fulfilled. Even the law itself. Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 8. The law was given to Moses as an eternal or everlasting, most frequently it's translated, everlasting covenant. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 11, says, It was done, and it was done away with. And now Christ is our covenant. Hebrews 8.13 agrees, saying, it's an everlasting, It was an everlasting covenant until... Christ made a new one. See? So many times it's in the same passage and we miss it because we've been taught not to see it. Just like Jonah in the belly of the whale. Jonah in chapter 2, verse 6. He says, I was in the belly of the whale forever until God delivered me. Forever. We... Have you not ever used the word that way as a colloquialism? We've been waiting on you forever. (laughs) It's been forever since I've seen you. Well, then technically you don't know this person. (laughs) Again, maybe not the easiest child to raise or the easiest person to be around right now. Understood. We talked about slavery in scripture a few months ago. Remember that Exodus chapter 21 and verse 6 said that a slave would serve his master forever. Now, we all know that they die. Yes, forever meant until they ceased to exist. When he died, forever was over and done with. Keep that phrase in your head. One of the passages often brought up by people who just can't let loose of an everlasting punishment is Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. And I'm glad, because I want them to read Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46. And so we're going to read it here. But the reason I want them to read it is not to prove their point, but to show them that they've missed something. Matthew 25, it's a judgment scene of Christ. I love that. I refer to it all the time. All the time. See, colloquialism. Uh, because it is a, it talks about we get into heaven. How? Why? And it has nothing to do with all the stuff we were told that would send us to hell. It has everything to do with loving people and caring for them. That's exciting to me. Well, we'll get to it. Matthew 25, I keep turning pages because Matthew 26 goes on a bit. Um, chapter 25, then they will go away to eternal punishment but the righteous to eternal life. A preacher, good man, a good man who's gone to be with his Lord now, once told me, he says, well, I plan to be with God for eternity, so I assume hell's got to be an eternity as well. Well, it doesn't say eternity. And that's not a net that I'm picking here. Eternal is an adjective. It is a modifier It is not a noun. What is a noun? A noun is a person, place, or thing, right? Well, it's not a noun. It's modifying a noun. I can look here at our soundstage. We have several of our people out this week, but we have a a visitor. We've got some friends with us. You know, I can look over there and and say Dan. I won't use last names because the internet's a scary place. Dan is a tall man. The Empire State Building is a tall building. Therefore, they're the same height. (laughs) One of our group, you won't be surprised who, said yes. But no, 
we all understand tall is a modifier of our concept of man. That tall is a modifier of our concept of a building. I remember when we first came to America in the, the mid-80s. Won't go to the back story. But we were visiting my parents in the, on the edge of Appalachia. And a church in Ohio, up in Lancaster, Ohio. Hi, Lancaster. I know several of you still listen and watch. Uh, asked me to come up and preach one Sunday. This is before the age of phones, Tom Toms, navigational aids, and the like. And so they said, you have to come up this route, Route 31, and then when you see the mountain, turn to the right. Well, have you ever been in Ohio? Except for the really southeast edge, uh, edge rather, they don't even have proper hills. Not to somebody who comes from the highlands. And so as I'm driving... I went right past. And I thought after a while, this is too long. I came back. I drove three or four times before I finally just, and there were no cell phones. You couldn't call and check. I just entered the town and I asked somebody, I stopped, there was a petrol station, gas station that happened to be open. And I said, where is Mount Pleasant? And they said, there, it was a bump. It was a bump. That's all it was. This was a pimple upon the, on, the, on the vast tapestry of the land. But to them, it was Mount. We lived in West Virginia. God bless West Virginia. We are mountaineers at heart, and part of it will always be that way. And we loved those mountains, but my wife wouldn't call them mountains. Why? Colorado. Right? We understand this. Do we not understand this? So eternal punishment and eternal life does not indicate they last the same length. They are modifiers for different nouns. Then you look at the noun. And what is the noun talking about? I-70 through Kansas is a long road. An anaconda is a long snake. They're not the same length. Punishment lasts as long as it needs to last. To refine and burn away the sins so that like Sodom, they can be restored with her sisters. Heaven is where we dwell for not an adjective, but a, a word we know, eternity, with a God who lasts forever. So that'll be a very long time indeed. One might even say an eternal time. Next week, more on what the punishment is all about. And how hell is described in scripture. But for now. Please be at peace. Knowing that God's love is greater than his wrath. It always has been. And God's justice. Is always played out in love. Because God is love. Be at peace. More next week.